Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 5, Newton's Laws of Motion. So we have two chapters uh, to cover what we are going to be calling standard strategy. Uh, Newton's Laws of Motion and how to use them in a, a physics problem solving. So that, that's chapters 5 and 6. We'll be spending three weeks doing that. So this week, our first week covering Newton's Laws of Motion. Uh, will be covering Newton's first, second, and third law. So uh, let me point out some of the things that your textbook covers and what you can expect to see in the lecture videos that you will see. So um, your textbook and also the recorded lectures that you will see starts out with the introduction of forces. And um, in some sense, forces are kind of simple. It, it's, um, it's a push or pull. <laughs> That's a good place to start. And uh, I think the hardest part is uh, making sure that you recognize things that are not force. So um, I do have a lecture video on going over those distinctions. Please watch that. It's a vector quantity, so it has a magnitude and direction. And um, your textbook kind of um, gives you some examples of that. And free body diagram is something that you will see, you'll be seeing a lot this semester. This is our, this is the first graphical problem solving tool that you will be introducing. And we have a whole problem solving strategy that I'm going to be calling standard strategy that you'll be spending a lot of time in the next three weeks or so. So, um, yeah. And, uh, We'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And so the, everything in the textbook, it's good to read it through. Uh, some of the things we might, uh, in the lecture, I might not talk in as much detail. Uh, like the vector notation for force. In this lower division class, I'll try to stay away from these uh, formal notations as long as we can. We'll be mostly be dealing with the, the component representations of force. But um, this is a more formal approach. It's good to read. Like what I hat means, J hat means, it's unit vectors along the direction of X and Y direction. I prefer X hat and Y hat when I use them, but you won't see me use any of them for quite a while because um, I'm trying to stay away for a bit from formal notations. But it's uh, something for you to look um, forward to, get used to these different conversion formulas, all that stuff. I think we did kind of cover this um, in the first week with the vectors and coordinate systems. So that's the section 5.1. Section 5.2 uh, covers Newton's first law. And I guess uh, uh, you won't see me lecture on Newton's first law. <laughs> and it's a sort of a deliberate choice that I've made. I guess uh, I will say these two things. Um, first is uh, after you've covered the Newton's second law, See if you can spot the difference between Newton's second law and Newton's first law. Um, so, you know, given what Newton's second law says, why do you even need Newton's first law? And uh, after giving that some thought, this, by the way, I don't cover in the lecture because, again, I made a decision not to cover it in lecture explicitly. But give yourself some time to think about it. Given what Newton's second law says, why do you need Newton's first law? And the real reason you need the Newton's first law is what your textbook makes reference to in this sentence. Um, ah, here it is. So this is the important sentence that a lot of even physics majors miss. Newton's first law is usually considered to be a statement about reference frames. That's the sense in which Newton's first law is not redundant. It covers something different from what Newton's second law covers. So in this uh, introductory lower division university physics class, I made a conscious decision not to focus on this so much. Because uh, frankly, when we are doing problem solving, we've already made a decision to cover described forces in the inertial reference frame. And the true purpose of Newton's first law is not so relevant in the limited situations we are in. But it's uh, something that's uh, meaningful, especially for those of you who might be you know, becoming physics majors, going on to physics graduate school, and these more abstract theoretical matters are important to you. So I do want to point that out in this overview video. Uh, this is really the purpose of the textbook, to cover uh, things that I decided not to cover in lecture. <laughs> so to read through that, um, 
The rest of it, I think, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of problem solving, we don't spend a lot of time with the Newton's first law. It's the Newton's second law where we'll spend a lot of time on. In fact, the standard strategy that we'll be introducing, you can think of that as a way to, as a kind of scaffold, the problem solving strategy getting to writing down Newton's second law. So uh, your textbook gives a statement of Newton's second law in terms of relationship between acceleration and net force. The acceleration comes from, it's caused by the net force and uh, for equality to the work, you divide by mass inertia. And, um, and this is uh, the main tool that we use to figure out acceleration of a body or other stuff that's mechanically interesting. And what we are going to be introducing as a standard strategy is really a way to um, kind of systemize how you write down the net force, how you write it, them down in a format that helps you get to the next step in problem solving. So, so Newton's second law is really what we'll be spending a lot of time with. Hopefully in three weeks or so, you feel very comfortable with the Newton's second law because that is our goal in covering um, uh, the, the standard strategy. And your textbook gives a lot of examples dealing with the Newton's second law. I think in this section, a lot of the examples are mostly one dimensional, I guess, except for this one. We'll have more examples that are truly uh, two dimensional. And I think as I mentioned in one of the earlier chapter overview videos, we try to stay away from the three-dimensional situations, mainly by picking a plane where all the interesting things happen. Uh, we won't really deal with the space as a fully three-dimensional thing until we get to reach the body motion where we have to. Uh, so as you are uh, dealing more in two dimensions, uh, this is a... Um, um, more of the reminder of the formal aspect of that, um, you know, force being vector, acceleration being vector. So when you write down what looks like a simple equation, you know, the acceleration, let me scroll up. This is a simple one equation, you know, acceleration is net force divided by mass, or, you know, net force is mass times acceleration. It's really three equations written like one equation. And in the component notation, your textbook is reminding you that uh, that's actually three equations <laughs> telling you that x component of net force is equal to this, y component of net force is equal to this, and the z component of net force is equal to this. So one of the things that we'll introduce in standard strategy is to how to organize things in such a way to make this a little bit simpler. Um, so, you know, we'll pick a plane where we don't have to worry about the z component at all, like the axis will be boring, so we don't bother writing it down. And we usually pick our x and y axis so that, uh, let's say, the y component of acceleration is zero. That'll simplify your equations. It'll help you not, you know, deal with the three <laughs> like independent equations uh, as much as possible. So, uh, so you will be working a lot with the Newton's second law. That's basically our entire. Um, Standard strategy. Uh, this last uh, subsection within section 5.3, um, uh, I think, uh, so we haven't covered the momentum in the textbook yet. It's coming up. And when we do cover momentum, this is a really important expression. This is actually the true definition of force. And um, I guess I'll just highlight this for now. We'll come back to this expression after we have covered the momentum. Uh, after we momentum means something to us in the context of this class. So, so that's Newton's second law. Uh, and before we get to Newton's third law, there's a bit of a distinction about mass and weight. I think a lot of you who have taken science class or high school physics class probably have heard this already, like a difference between mass and weight. Even though in everyday life, we talk about kilogram and pound as uh, referring to the same thing. Kilogram is mass. It covers how much stuff is there. Pound in the uh, customer unit system refers to force. So uh, it refers to weight. Weight is referring to gravitational force associated with the amount of mass. And um, the, it, so if you haven't seen that distinction before, please read section 5.4. I think I don't spend a lot of time on that distinction in the lecture, kind of assuming you already know it, or if not, 
that you can read it in the text of it. Uh, okay, a few more sections remaining. Uh, Newton's third law, this is what I refer to as the most uh, often misunderstood law of uh, Newton's laws of motion. I do have lecture videos specific on that. Uh, do please uh, watch it. The way your textbook uh, kind of spells out Newton's third law, this is how you should think of it. Not, you know, for every action there's equal and opposite reaction. Um, that leads to more confusion than not, but this uh, longer way of saying it. Whenever one body exerts a force on a second body, the first body experiences a force that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force that it exerts on the second body. That is, um, that lengthier way, I think that'll help you avoid some of the common mistakes. And your textbook, I think, actually highlights some of the common mistakes. In, in this section, it will give you a ton of examples do look at them. I think those are helpful. And one figure that I thought was really helpful was this one. Because uh, the some of the most common mistakes that people make in, with regard to Newton's third law is they just to focus on that equal and opposite. And they say that on a body, there's an equal and opposite force of gravity and normal force. And they want to pair them up as Newton's third law pair. And, uh, as this diagram is showing, it's not the Newton's third law pair. It's calling Newton's first law pair in the sense that these two forces adding up to zero makes this body stay at rest. Okay, but that uh, like first law doesn't require such pairs. Uh, and with the Newton's third law pairs, um, what you have to watch out for is that those two forces have to be acting on two different objects. Like one force is acting on this object. The other force is acting on this object. And um, really, the equal and opposite thing, it's almost better if you forget about it altogether and let's just start. You first start by identifying the two forces that are paired through Newton's third law. And once you identify them, then that identification tells you that these two forces must have the same magnitude. That's the real utility of Newton's third law. And uh, I'll mention something called uh, something I call Newton's third law check when we do standard strategy. That will be coming up next week and on as you deal with a more complex system. So I think that uh, yeah, all these are interesting. I don't think I covered this example. This is a good example to think through. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, a bit of a um, advertisement. So uh, your textbook section five point six uh, talks about common forces. This is something that I do uh, did spend uh, uh, quite a bit of time in lecture thinking about and um, explaining. So in the lecture module, you will see a lecture called the types of force. Please watch it. It covers, um, uh, well, these common forces, and it covers uh, some of the um, mistakes people make with the different types of force, how you should think about forces. So, um, so do read the textbook, you know, section 5.6, common forces, and also please watch the types of force lecture. I cover, you know, normal force, tension, uh, spring force, I, I do mention it, uh, spring, uh, spring force, friction, and uh, graph. Uh, wait, this one doesn't mention gravity uh, because we did it up there. I mentioned gravity and can and explain what sets gravity apart. So do please watch the lecture. And I think it's a little bit early to talk about this, you know, real forces and inertial frames. I do have a lecture on why we avoid the rotating frames a few weeks down the line. But um, the Coriolis force that you see in um, illustrations like this, that is actually the main reason we avoid dealing with accelerating frames. Um, other, the, the, you know, it's the kind of situation where if you want to do it correctly, it needs upper division level maths. So in this lower division, let's not deal with it. Let's work with the inertial frame so that we don't have to deal with all that advanced math stuff. And finally, um, your textbook has a bit of a weird division of um, introduction of Newton's laws and uh, discussion of the problem solving techniques with the Newton's laws. So this is the um, topic that I think more properly belongs in the next week for us, because it's when you are applying Newton's laws to solve problems, that's when you have to think about drawing free body diagrams correctly, accurately, 
Um, but it's in chapter five, so do read it this week um, and come back to it next week maybe as a reminder, especially when it comes to problem solving strategy. This is part of what we call standard strategy. Uh, we have different set of steps that are numbered differently, but they add up to about the same thing. Because uh, in the end, there's really only one way to do the um, solve the problems correctly. So, um, so we'll be coming back to this more in the coming uh, next two weeks. One thing that I will highlight that your textbook does that annoys me. Um, but now that I realize your textbook does it, I won't yell at you if you do it. I don't recommend that you do it, which is... Uh, so, you know, this is the free body diagram. It's a correct free body diagram. They've identified all the forces, you know, gravity pulling down, normal force supporting, gravity normal force, and this pulling force. And this is the thing that your textbook does that annoys me. When they are breaking down this force, they scratch out the original vector and then draw two new vectors, X and Y components. I think it's unnecessary. I think it clutters up your diagram. Um, so there's the style in which I do it, where I try to complete this triangle, you know, X and Y component, and I make sure to draw those X and Y components in a way that they won't be confused as on other vectors. Um, the way your textbook does it, I find it more confusing, but somehow if this looks better to you, then fine. Your textbook does it. I can't really yell at you for doing what your textbook is doing, but I just want you to highlight that this is not what I recommend. If you want to see what I recommend, watch my lecture videos. Uh, more next week, when we do standard strategy, you will see a ton of examples of me drawing free body diagrams. So that's all the sections in chapter five. Uh, please look at that. Uh, we do cover basically everything that your textbook covers in the lectures as well. So until next time, bye.